<laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to Thursday, Newton Wellesley Medical Group Lunch and Learn. We're very excited today to hear about universal screening from substance use disorders and a brief primer how to integrate that into our primary care practice. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Baravel, Dr. Armstrong, and Dr. Sanchez Samper here with us. I did want to um, once again uh, tell folks that um, CME credit is available for this talk, and we will post this up in the chat room. The code today is PASFOH. Um, and as you know, you're, um, you can text that to the daily CMS code. If you're having trouble with that, feel free to email us offline. Whoops. Skip through. And then uh, I also want to tease next week's and the following week so you guys can set your calendars. Um, next week, we'll be hearing about surgery for heartburn uh, from uh, Charu Parantape uh, and uh, Lana Schumacher. And then the following week, we'll hear about regenerative medicine updates. Um, from our PMR department, Dr. Borgstein and Dr. Eng. We're very excited about that. Two other quick notes. As you know, our talks are all posted up on YouTube, usually by that afternoon. Um, if you can't remember the name of the talk, you can just search YouTube, Newton Wellesley Medical Group, Lunch and Learn, and all of our talks will come up. Um, and also, um, while we can still do it, you will receive 30 minutes of uh, Category 1 credits, um, as I mentioned previously. I'm gonna turn it over now, um, I don't know who's talking first, but to our substance use team. Thanks so much for being here, you guys. Welcome, I'm Anshu Baravel. John, if you can go to the next slide, please. Just wanna let you know that we have no disclosures. Next slide. I'm here today to introduce you to the team. We've seen a huge increase in the amount of incredible people that have joined the team in the last, last couple months and the last year. Many of these faces, some that you know, but many that you might not. So our goal today is really to introduce you to the Substance Use Services team. I founded the Substance Use Services team with Katrina Armstrong a few years ago, and we are extremely proud to be able to present to you now that we have Dr. Sanchez Samper, who's our psychiatrist. Um, we have Angela Zaydon, who's our LICSW counselor. Hallie Delory, who's our recovery coach. And Donna Goulet, who's our medical assistant as part of the team. So we're very proud to be at Newton Wellesley Hospital and thankful to leadership for supporting us in these efforts. Next slide. When people hear the word substance use disorder or addiction, it's oftentimes a reaction of, oh, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help my patients. I know this is a problem. This is a problem with my patients. This is a problem in our community, and this is a problem really worldwide. What we're hoping to do today is to give you a couple pieces of information and some tools so that you can feel like you can adequately counsel your patients as well as refer them to specialized treatment when it's appropriate. This is National Recovery Month. I hope that you've all had the opportunity to see the purple flags in front of Newton Wellesley Hospital. I think they're, they're hauntingly beautiful and extraordinarily powerful message to us to remember that addiction is everywhere and opioid use disorder continues to impact our communities. We have had over 2,000 deaths related to opioid overdoses in Massachusetts in 2019. And unfortunately, that continues to rise. If we can go to the next slide. We also know that this is unfortunately increasing and in light of the social isolation now during COVID-19, we are seeing an increase in alcohol use, alcohol sales, and patients that really need our help. So although we're not asking you to be an expert, we're looking to be part of your team and know that we can help support you in making sure that we provide the best care for our patients with substance use disorder. Uh, the next slide. So with that, uh, we'll be talking about understanding the stigma and the impact that our language has on our patient's care. We'd like to familiarize your, you with some of the screening tools that are now part of inpatient admission. So these are required by our nursing colleagues to, um, to ask our patients, those that are admitted from the emergency department. And so we hope you will get, gain an understanding of what these tools mean. And I think that we will see them more around elective surgery as well as in the outpatient arena. And some of these tools, screening tools, are available to you if you would like to use them in EPIC. So what is your role in implementing these screening tools? And how can we help you understand what the available resources are? And we'd like to give you a little introduction into the role of medications in team-based substance use care. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sanchez and Dr. Armstrong. So good afternoon and thank you all for, for joining us uh, during this Lunch and Learn. 
Um, 25 minutes is, seems like a short period of time to tackle such a big and important topic as addiction or substance use disorders. Um, but as Dr. Bereveld shared with you guys, it's the perfect opportunity for you guys to, to leave having learned some key things and some key tools that will help you to identify identify patients that are struggling with substance use disorders and refer them to the SUS service so that we can partner with you in caring for these patients. So before we start off with what is addiction or what addiction is, I would actually like to point out what addiction isn't. And what addiction isn't is it's not a character flaw or a character deficit, right? It's not something that, as they said in Minnesota, where I did my residency training at Mayo Clinic, that you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps or just snap out of it, right? It's a condition that mimics a lot of the medical conditions that you guys are already treating in primary care that have biopsychosocial underpinnings and a lot of sometimes you know, genetic underpinnings and that as such um, have biopsychosocial treatments. So in many ways, you guys are already more than 50% there by understanding um, that the way in which we approach the treatment for substance use disorders is the same way that we, that we treat chronic relapsing and remitting conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, and others. So addiction is defined as a primary chronic disease involving brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry that, as, as I said, um, like other chronic uh, diseases, it often involves cycles of exacerbation and remission. So in the same way that we probably would not fire a patient from your medical practice if they weren't monitoring their diabetes correctly and their glycosylated hemoglobin was out of whack, um, the same thing, the same approach pertains to caring for patients with substance use disorders. If and when they're having a slip, a lapse, or a relapse, it's actually an opportunity for us to reassess what's working and what's not working, to modify our approach to treatment, and to add additional in uh, interventions or referrals if needed. So relapses, similarly, are not considered treatment failures. Um, we've all, we, we always see them as an opportunity to learn something and to do something differently. Because what we do know is that without treatment, addiction can actually be progressive with increased morbidity and mortality. And so the rationale for screening, whether it's in an inpatient or an outpatient setting, eh, is for us to identify patients early on so that we can empower ourselves with the right resources to help them to get help. And again, in this kind of setting, um, to partner with us at the, at, at the SUS service to help care for these patients. So early identification and intervention can reduce the physical and emotional consequences associated with substance use disorders. And again, I don't want you to forget this is a very treatable illness. It's illness. Um, in the over 20 years that I've been doing this kind of work, I have yet to meet somebody that woke up one day and said, you know what? I think I want to develop an alcohol use disorder. And I want to not show up for work. I want to disappoint my spouse and my kids. Or somebody with an opiate use disorder that says, you know what, I'd like to have several overdoses, maybe develop hep C from needle sharing. Not once have I heard somebody uh, wake up and decide that that's what they want to do or to struggle with in their life. Um, and what we know from genetic studies that anywhere from 50 to 65% of the likelihood of somebody developing a substance use disorder, what's, what's considered a heritability coefficient, is, is present at the time in which sperm meets egg. So none of us can control what color eyes we're born with in the same way that we can't control or predict how our brains are going to react in, uh, upon exposure to substances like alcohol, opiates, and others at later stages of it in life. Next slide, please. So let's spend a few minutes talking about what stigma is. So stigma is defined as the dehumanization of an, of an individual that through the process of labeling, stereotyping, and social rejection, discredits, devalues, and actually contributes to marginalization and exclusion. And this, unfortunately, is very common, both in the treatment of patients with mental health 
substance use disorders, or both. And the effects of stigma is that actually it, uh, patients already, when they struggle with mental health or substance use disorders, carry a lot of guilt, remorse, and shame that may actually limit or paralyze them from actually seeking the help that they need uh, out of that guilt, remorse, and shame, um, and unfortunately contrib contribute to leaving treatment early or to having poorer outcomes. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. So it's important to know that uh, we do have the power and capacity to reduce the stigma of addiction. I was fortunate, fortunately raised by a strong Colombian mother who came from a strong line of, uh, of strong women with uh, Irish Catholic backgrounds that raised us to know the power of language and with the concept of it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Um, so I'd like to invite all of you, if you take nothing else from this lunch and learn, to be aware of how your actions can reduce stigma and to use person first, medically accurate language, to use humility and compassion and to be conscious of, of, of existing dynamics. So in many ways, in the same way that we wouldn't say to residents or fellows that, or to our colleagues or to medical students that we're mentoring and training, let's go see that cirrhosis in bed 102 right, but patient that's struggling with or that has been diagnosed with cirrhosis. When it comes to patients with substance use disorders, I'd like to invite you to do the same, right, and to use person-first language that respects them as people who are struggling or have been diagnosed with alcohol, with opiate use disorders, and the like. Certainly be mindful of your own biases and leave them at, at, and leave them at the door or in the parking lot at Newton Wellesley. That's entirely up to you. And certainly um, be an agent of change, call out stigma when you, when you see it and educate others. So back to the power of words. Some of the stigmatizing language that culturally we have fallen in, in, into using are using terminology such as substance abuser or using term, words that end in ick, which for me, again, the mnemonic is that it sounds icky. So um, I don't refer to my patients as alcohol X or add X, but again, as a person with a substance use disorder or person requiring opioids for chronic pain. Now, I, I, I'd like to ask a show of hands. How many of you have ever, ever heard of a dirty diabetic or a clean hypertensive? Again, since medical school, residency, fellowship, and in the work that I've been doing, I have never heard that terminology being used to describe our patients struggling with medical conditions. Yet the stigma of substance use disorders is such that we use words like clean or dirty to refer to our patients in recovery or when they've relapsed, or uh, to refer to the, the, the presence of positive uh, uh, or negative substances in their urine as a positive or a negative urine. And, and, and use words like clean or dirty. So again, I'd like to invite you guys to avoid some of the words that are in the, in the left, uh, left side of the, of the screen and to use much more empowering words um, that can decrease stigma and empower our patients. Uh, next slide, and I'll introduce you to Dr. Armstrong, who will talk to you about SBIRT. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here today. We are really so excited to be able to have the opportunity to talk to you about this important topic and to introduce uh, screening, universal screening and, and our service. Many of you um, have uh, been introduced to our service, um, are aware of us and, and may also be aware of universal screening. But what I'd like to do next is to just go over some of the, the basics and some of the changes that now are taking place within, um, within our, our partners hospitals. So I thought I would start with this slide um, of a pyramid, which basically um, puts together the idea of SBIRT and screening, uh, both on the general screening and more specific. It also goes through how we can use this screening to help support our patients. So SBIRT, which is screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment, is, is really the entire process of, of what we are doing to help identify and support our patients that are struggling with substance use disorders. You'll see on the left-hand side is the arrow that goes up from the foundation of the pyramid to the top, which 
intensifies and makes, uh, allows more specificity of intervention. On the right hand side are the actual um, individual types of screening, which I'll review. And then specific in interventions um, for the medical provider to help support the patient. Within the pyramid, you'll see that we're moving from a lower risk patient up to a high risk, uh, a higher risk patient that may have more dependent use. So starting with the single universal screen question now, in which we will review it, every patient will come in and have an individual screening question, which I'll go over in the next slide. But after that patient, if they do screen positive, the, the next step of this process is to identify what the substance is that maybe the person may be struggling with and use two specific individual simple screens that we'll review to further identify and support the patient. If you look to the right of the, the pyramid at low to medium in the red, we are identifying audit C, which um, specifically looks at alcohol use disorder, or DAS-10, which looks at opioid use disorder. A low to medium screen on the, on the audit C would be less than eight, and on the DAS-10 would be greater than six. Uh, would be less than six, sorry, for, for low to medium. If a patient screens low to medium, we may be prompted as the responding clinician or primary care physician to have a discussion, a further discussion with our patient as we go through these individual audit C or DAS-10 screens. If the screen uh, is, uh, is a higher level of screen or the conversation indicates that the patient ha is, is having a significant struggle, struggle that indicates a hazardous or harmful, medium to um, higher risk, this may prompt the primary care physician or the responding clinician to possibly uh, put in an EPIC consult for substance use services or could to consider medical management therapy for this patient. Moving to the top of the pyramid, with higher level of screening or an indication um, from a conversation and intervention with the primary provider that this patient is high risk or dependent use on uh, within a substance may indicate that the patient may need transfer after the hospitalization or even um, uh, during part of the hospitalization to a higher level of care indicating inpatient residential or detoxification uh, from the substance in question. So that's just a, a brief overview of the, the, the screening process in the individual. And now, if you could go to the next slide, we'll go to the uh, individual screening. So um, as of now, all patients admitted through the ED will be screened for a, with a single question. So this is the substance single question screener upon admission. This is all seen in EPIC, and this will be administered by the, the RN that is admitting the patient. The question that the patient will be asked is, one simple question, how many times in the past year have you used an illegal drug or prescription medication for non-medical reasons? And for example, um, used for reasons such as the experience um, or feeling that it may have caused. You'll see right below that is um, the option for if a patient cannot, um, is unable to assess um, substance use screening. If the patient answers one or greater, a best practice action will inform the respondent clinician of the physician's positive response. Uh, at this point, the respondent clinician will move to those two screens that I just mentioned on the side of the pyramid. A DAST-10, a screening tool for opioid use disorder, or an audit C, and we'll, we'll move forward, but we're focusing on the DAST-10 at this point. If the patient's response is zero, it will um, no further action. So next slide, please. So I'd like to just go over the DAS-10, which is um, also called the drug use screen. And I'd like to review it just briefly as it, it um, I think it is a scary thing to think about a big screen and that it's very complicated and needs an enormous amount of intervention. And, and I bring it up here just because it's actually a quite a simple screen. It has um, an ability to screen um, in two different categories, a DAS-10 of one to six um, is a, a lower level screen. Um, it would indicate um, either uh, little to no issues regarding drug use screening, and this is what we're talking about here is opioid use disorder, or greater than six is a moderate to substantial level, um, possibly needing further intensive uh, uh, assessment. As you'll see, the DAS-10 reviews over the past 12 months. In the past 12 months, 
um, have you used drugs other than required? Um, this is, uh, is similar to the first, the first question that we have in the universal screening. So most often people will move to the second question. Um, do you use more than one drug at a time? How often have there been blackouts? Um, do you feel guilty? Has their loved ones, has this affected your job or your ability to function? Has, have medical uh, problems been a result of this particular substance? So each of this, uh, these questions are indicated by a simple um, yes or no, which indicates the overall score. So I just wanted to de demystify the DAST-10 um, for opioid use disorder uh, screening. Please go to the next slide. So opioids, um, we, I'd, I'd like to just take a moment to focus on opioids and, and monitoring for withdrawal when a patient comes, um, comes into the office or the hospital. So in general, what we're talking about here and what the DAST-10 is referring to are opioids, including heroin, analgesic medications such as oxycodone, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, morphone, morphine, fentanyl, and tramadol, and also um, being aware that um, patients that are uh, eliciting a history of heroin use and heroin use disorder, most often in, in, uh, in the current state, we are having an indication that patients are also using um, fentanyl, unknowingly or unknowingly, most of the heroin um, that is being used nowadays is uh, tainted in some form with fentanyl. So just to, to be aware of that. We are indicating. We, we are looking at what um, what tolerance looks like. Has has the patient have does the patient have evidence of tolerance? Um, and it can develop within weeks um, of chronic daily use, and an indication of uh, abrupt cessation, which results in withdrawal, promotes relapse, and continued drug intake. Once we've identified that uh, a patient may be uh, with in withdrawal. We, um, we are aware of this as the patient comes in that symptoms start as early as six to eight hours after the last dose of an opioid. And we use what's called a cow scale, which indicates the, um, the clinical assessment of withdrawal symptoms. There's, uh, the result of opioid withdrawal is actually an increased activity of the autonomic nervous system. So within the cow scale, we have um, an indication of looking at uh, the patient's um, uh, automatic nervous system, such as yawning, goosebumps, um, uh, sweating, GI disturbances. And these are all indicated on the cow scale, which is a simple epic um, uh, automated uh, way to measure the cows. The acute phase may last up to seven to seven, 10 days. And at this point, there is automated epic um, protocols for both methadone or buprenorphine um, withdrawal protocols, which um, are easily found in EPIC. Please go to the next slide. So um, a little bit about the medication treatment beyond opioid withdrawal. So the patient has moved through opioid withdrawal, maybe within the hospital setting. And the next stage is to talk to the patient about what are the next steps. This is often maybe in the context of having a substance use services uh, conversation, a consult uh, and or a follow up after the hospitalization with our team. Patient, um, depending on their preference, uh, both methadone or buprenorphine are used as long term treatment for opioid use disorder. Providing patients uh, with these medications is the most effective treatment available for opioid use disorder and has been shown to reduce uh, drug use, overdose and mortality. The process of establishing the correct dose is really a system that we work closely with the team within the hospital to really help facilitate. And the symptoms, um, uh, the treatment begins often within the hospitalization or within our outpatient setting or the primary care setting. Induction plans are, are individualized to treat patient uh, treatment needs and the management of induction, again, use, um, uses the scale that I mentioned earlier, the cow scale to help best um, help the, ensure the patient gets onto the appropriate dose and type of medication. Next slide, please. Best practices are always good to remember um, in talking to the patient, whether in the hospital or in, in the outpatient office setting, that um, all patients that, that have um, a history of opioid use disorder, it's very important to go over Safe Injection Practices and Naloxone um, Guide. This is found on the Primary Care Office Insight, but it's an opportunity to have, uh, have, have a conversation with a patient about what is the safe 
what is, is the safe practice? If there is opioids at, at, um, that are either prescribed or not prescribed, what are the important things for the patient to know about the use of opioids? If a patient is struggling with opioid use disorder, especially injection drug use, always consider screening for HIV, Hep A, B, and C. And um, uh, in accordance, always considering post and pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. And again, naloxone at discharge is always an important intervention, whether a patient is prescribed or is not prescribed and struggling with opioid use disorder. Next slide, please. So just a brief, um, a few words on alcohol withdrawal. Uh, the second screen that I mentioned was the Audit C. The Audit C is a, is a simple three-item three, three item questionnaire. So again, to demystify this second screening, a patient has come in, they have, te they have screened positive for the universal questionnaire. The issue um, that they are struggling with is alcohol. So moving directly to the Audit C. The Audit C simply looks at how often do you have a, a, a drink containing alcohol, how many standard drinks do you have in a day, and how often do you have six or more. This, uh, this score will indicate um, an audit C score of eight or higher is considered high risk. Um, and that is where the, the cutoff is. And always trying to um, help the patient understand what is a typical um, size of a drink. And I've uh, indicated that on the upper slide to the right. Next slide, please. Treatment beyond alcohol use, use uh, acute withdrawal. Um, I think uh, many people are uh, familiar with the withdrawal protocol of alcohol use disorder within the hospital, but what do we do after? Well, you know, what are, are some of the, the things that we can talk to our patients about when they are getting ready to leave the hospital and really would like to um, address the alcohol use disorder? We have three FDA approved medications um, that we have at our disposal. Naltrexone, also called Revia. Um, this can be an oral and an IM form. Uh, the IM form is called Vivitrol. Acamprosate is the second medication, and the third one um, is Diselfram, which is rarely used, um, but I mention it only because it is still FDA approved. There are off-label options as well um, that are not approved yet, topiramate and gabapentin, which we will not um, address at this time. Patients should be offered this treatment, all of these treatment options and medications, as well as the importance of psychosocial treatment, addressing mental health needs, uh, offering community support, offering support within our services at Substance Use Services, identifying that within our team, we have a recovery coach, an LICSW therapist, social worker, an addiction psychiatrist, and we are so happy to meet with uh, patients at all levels of their care and help them negotiate uh, the substance use disorder that they may be struggling with. You can see PCOI for more detail for primary care office insight and guidelines for alcohol use disorder. Please, uh, uh, next slide. So finally, we, we just wanted to let you know that our patients need all of our help and we are here as substance use services to help support our patients, to support you as, as inpatient practitioners, outpatient practitioners, whether it's a phone call to let us um, uh, to or to have a patient referred to our, our services, both in the inpatient and outpatient setting. Um, understanding uh, universal screening and, uh, and the importance of intervening at a time, which could be crucial for the patient. Maybe that's hospitalization, the ED visit, what, whatever that is. And remembering that sometimes it may be the family member that's there and that, that you can, we can be a, a source where we can help intervene and, and help with that patient at that stage of their care. The SUS team is here. We're in the blue building in 401. We are there and available Monday through Friday for inpatient and outpatient consults. And we have the phone number um, right there for you to identify. And thank you all for, for listening to us today and uh, taking the time. Here are the references. Thank you guys. Um, I think uh, there was uh, one question about how quickly we can get, so you guys can get someone in. Um, and um, I think uh, it was answered. You guys are pretty good about um, getting folks in. I also know from my own personal experience with my, with my primary care practice that Katrina and Anja and the whole team is really available for quick questions and are super passionate about this. So I know that um, they'd be happy to answer any direct or indirect questions um, that way as well. Um, yeah, thanks for this great presentation, uh, what to expect when people get admitted. Um, the code is posted. And don't forget, we have some uh, couple of, uh, good, good talks coming up in the next couple of weeks. So uh, it is one o'clock, so I do want to uh, sign off. I want to thank everyone for coming, and I hope everyone has a really nice weekend. And we'll see you all next Thursday. 
um, and we'll get this up on YouTube um, so you can pass it on. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye.